Hi, everybody, and welcome. It's Friday, so it must be Kinetics USA weekly show, Onwards and Upwards, everything that a healthcare worker needs to know about coming to live and work in the United States. I am your host, Tanya Friedman, and we have an exciting show for you today. We had a few uh, Friday gremlins, so unfortunately, we're not able to stream on StreamYard, which is what we typically do every Friday, but we will be using Zoom. So unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to take questions in the chat, um, but we have an expert panel that will be joining us today, and we're very excited to talk about our topic, MedTechs, med medical technologists coming to the United States. So we are very excited to get started today. Um, and I am joined by our guests. Um, we are going to be joined by uh, Elissa Scotland. Hi, Elissa. Welcome. You on mute, Elissa. Elissa, you on mute? <laughs> good morning, everyone. Or good evening. Well, <laughs> good morning, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome, welcome. We are also joined by Paul. Welcome, Paul. Hello, good morning. Morning, Paul. Or Welcome. Good evening, however that may be. <laughs> Wherever everybody is in the world. Um, we are joined by Ali. Welcome, Ali. Hi, good day, good morning, good evening, wherever you are in the world right now. <laughs> Thank you for joining us, Ali. Um, and we also have a few guests that will be joining us later in the show. So if you are watching today and you are interested in coming to the United States, please apply to Kinetics USA. We would love to help you if you are a registered nurse, if you are a med tech, if you are um, a CNA, a nurse aide, all lots of different positions available throughout the United States. And we would love to have you uh, join us in the United States. So we're going to get started on the show. I'm going to try and juggle back and forth and see if I can take some questions in the chat as well, because this is not typically how we do things um, uh, go, doing the, uh, the show on Zoom. Um, but I'm going to get started now and um, we're going to start with some introductions. So um, Elissa, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Certainly. Well, thanks for having me here today. I'm an international healthcare recruitment consultant formerly um, a physician, and I've lived, worked, and studied on three continents, and I'm delighted to now be living my USA dream. Okay, well, we're excited to have you here, Alyssa. As a physician, I think you bring an interesting perspective, um, but I know that you've been working with allied healthcare workers for some time now, so a lot of pointers and tips that Alyssa is going to be able to share with everybody. Um, Paul, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure. Um, my name is Paul. I am a uh, I'm a licensed clinical laboratory scientist, medical technologist, uh, whichever you prefer. Um, I have been in the field since the early '90s. Um, I'm a bit different than uh, most uh, clinical laboratory scientists. My background is in IT. Uh, I, I do have experience in the lab on the bench, obviously, uh, but my my primary background is um, information technology. Okay, so an interesting background. Um, and Paul's going to give us his perspective from the, the employer's side. Um, and last but not least, Ali, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself, Ali? Thank you. Hi, good day, good evening, everybody. So I'm Ali Brian Tagliari, and I'm a medical technologist here in New York, USA. Um, and I've been in the practice for seven years. Um, more or less seven years in the Philippines. And um, in that uh, span of years, I've been practicing as an academe and at the same time working in the hospital setup. So I would say that um, on my years of experience, I have both worlds of um, the academia and the actual practice. Okay, great, Ali. So we look forward to learning more about your journey of coming to the United States and seeing what that was like for you. So Elissa, let's start off with you and just let's give a definition. Paul was talking about medical technologists, clinical lab mm -hmm. scientists. I know there are lots of terms that can be bandied around like histotechnologist, um, medical lab technician. When we speak about med techs, what are we actually speaking about? So these are all clinical laboratory professionals 
that prepare and analyze a variety of biological um, specimen, specimens. So the terms technologist and scientist and medical and clinical, these terms are interchangeable with um, each other. Um, so a technologist is, or a scientist, performs more complex tasks and tests and uh, laboratory procedures than a technician. And then you mentioned about um, a histo technologist. Well, histo is to do with tissue. So someone working in histology um, deals with the thin slices of human tissue, whereas the other, what we would normally call med techs, deal with other um, bodily fluids and blood, urine and bodily products like this. So that's the main difference. Okay, well, thank you for clarifying that, that for us. So today's show is going to be specifically about medical med techs. Um, Ollie, did you always want to become a med tech? Tell us about that. Well, frankly speaking, or honestly speaking, I would say that being a medical technologist was not really my first of choice when I okay. was uh, planning <laughs> my future when I was still in high school. But I would say that um, there are no regrets as to my position as a medical technologist now here and actually practicing what I have learned in the school. I would say that I have learned to love my profession and I have embraced all its uh, difficulties and all its challenges. And I would say, uh, based on my years of experience as a medical technologist, I would say that um, I love the challenge. I love the adrenaline of the profession, the pressure is what keeps me energetic and enthusiastic every time I go to work. Okay, good. So the, the love evolved, Ali. <laughs> yeah, indeed. <laughs> but Paul, did you always want to become a med tech? Because it sounds like uh, you had a varied background as well. <laughs> uh, yeah, I no, that was not my first choice. Um, uh, my first choice was uh, engineering, and I found that that didn't quite agree with me. Uh, in the long run. And um, I basically, I, I fell into medical technology um, kind of as a, a secondary option. But, uh, you know, uh, like Ollie, uh, over the years, this is, it has been very good to me. Um, I mean, obviously, uh, I'm here with you guys talking about this. So, um, yeah, it has changed over the last 25 years. Uh, it's become very interesting. Um, uh, and we can get more into that uh, later, but uh, yeah, I, I would agree. It was not my first choice, but it was a good choice. Um, it, it was the choice that was that I was meant for. Uh, we don't always know what's best for us, and uh, sometimes the best comes for us. Sometimes it's a little bit of a zigzag. It's That's right. you, you kind of move in one direction and in another. Even Alyssa is nodding her head there, being a physician mm -hmm. and now working as in allied recruitment. Probably something you didn't ex anticipate either, Alyssa. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> um, so, Paul, um, what made Methodist Lebanon decide to look at hiring international med techs? Um, well, uh, obviously, we have a difficult time finding local uh, clinical laboratory scientists. Um, we have we have some local schools or a local school. Um, However, we have many, many hospitals, uh, several systems in the area, and we're only graduating, um, if I remember correctly, uh, somewhere between eight and 12 uh, scientists a year. So um, that, that's difficult to compete with, particularly when you know they're not necessarily planning to stay in the area. Uh, and I have experience previously with international associates and it was very positive. So, um, you know, in discussions with our senior leadership in the system, uh, that was uh, what kind of pushed us into uh, considering this. And, and it has been a very good process so far. Okay. And mm -hmm. I think, Paul, you probably would agree that this is very, very common for most healthcare facilities in the United States right now. Yeah, I would absolutely. Um, I think very much across the entire country, uh, there is a shortage of clinical laboratory scientists, and um, it is very difficult to compete uh, for really good med techs. Yeah, and that really is a problem in the United States, but also an opportunity for international med techs who want to come to the United States, like Ali. Ali, did you always want to come to the United States? Um, I would say at first, uh, when I first graduated as a medical laboratory scientist, I 
did not really have any plans in migrating in the United States. Uh, but then as time passes by, uh, I've been um, aware of the opportunities of um, a medical technologist here in the United States. And um, I would say that compared to any other countries, um, indeed the United States uh, opens the doors uh, to its uh, medical laboratory scientists, not only inside the four corners of the laboratory, but also outside um, what is happening in the laboratory. What is good in the United States is that it offers a lot of opportunities for medical technologists. Here, medtechs can practice beyond their profession. Uh, some can become directors, some can become sa sales associates, some would um, uh, work in the crime scene and all of those things. Uh, so the opportunity is limitless here in the United States when it comes to our profession as medical laboratory scientists. Lots and lots of opportunities. So if you are medtech now watching anywhere around the world, this is an opportunity. As Paul said, there are many healthcare facilities like Methodist Labana, amazing organization and many other opportunities around the United States. And as Ali said, there's more opportunity here in the United States than probably there's ever been. So now is the time to become to come to America if that's something that you've been considering. Um, I feel so cut off this morning uh, because we are usually on StreamYard and I can take questions in the chat and we can show uh, pictures and slides and videos. So today, unfortunately, we're a little bit more limited because of a technical hitch with StreamYard. Um, and I know, Ali, we had some great um, pictures um, that you had shared of life in America. So we're going to post those into the chat um, because I think it's really fun for everybody to see the, the, the life and the experience that you have been uh, in, you know, that you have had here in the United States. And um, I see that um, we also have Don, Don Hudson joining us. Hi, Don, welcome. Oh. <laughs> Don is no stranger to Onwards and Upwards. So welcome back, Don. And um, we're here. having a a few technical hitches, but Don, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Absolutely. I'm Don Hudson, and I am the Chief Talent Officer for Methodist of Honor Healthcare. And, uh, you know, we are an uh, amazing uh, organization here in Memphis, Tennessee, and our role is to serve our community, and, and we do that through great healthcare, but also um, just really caring about the people that, that come here. And and that's our associates, you know, we can't treat our patients any better than we treat each other. So our organizational culture is really important to us and, and it will be to you too, right? It's not just what you do in life, but it's who you do it with that matters most. And, and so we try to be a great place to work and we are recognized as a great place to work. And then we try to serve our community uh, by being at our best so we can uh, help them be better too. Thank you, Don. And we love Methodist Labana. We have placed hundreds of nurses at the, the facility um, and many med techs as well. Um, so really an awesome place to work. And if anyone is interested in Methodist Labana, please check out the showcase that we did on Methodist Labana. Don, I don't know how long ago it was. I think it was quite a few months ago already. The year has flown. <laughs> <laughs> maybe a year, um, yeah, maybe a year ago. Maybe yeah. a year. Um, maybe, maybe back in the spring. Yeah, it might have been the spring. So a few months back. So please check that out on the Kinetics USA website. Um, and if you want to learn more about Methodist Labana and what an awesome organization it is. Um, so if we move forward now, Elissa, and start talking about the process of coming to the United States. Obviously, there are the immigration requirements, there are the occupational um, uh, requirements, and, and then there's the institutional requirements. So if we talk about the success path of coming to the United States, um, and we talk about, oh, there we go, we, we'd be able to show some, some slides, which is great. Elissa, do you wanna talk us through just how does a medtech know if they are eligible um, those first few steps on that success path that need to be taken in order to come and live and work in the United States. Right. So if we look at this chart here, this path, we can see all the way on the left side, step one, it's, it's referring to the ASCP. Um, and this is the American Society for Clinical Pathology. Um, we've just got a different slide yeah. I think we're having an issue. Yeah, the gremlins are at us this morning. 
<laughs> um, I have my own, own version here. So this is um, this is really the first step is passing the appropriate exam. So usually it's the medical laboratory scientist examination through this organization. Uh, we mentioned earlier about histotechnologists. They have a slightly different um, exam um, to take through the ASCP. So that's the very first step. And the ASCP has their own eligibility criteria and all of that can be found on their website. Um, the next step is um, passing an English proficiency exam. And so this is the same exam that the nurses take as well and other healthcare professionals. Um, they're the main um, two things to be doing. Um, and as well as that, there are some occupational um, excuse me, some institutional requirements. And all of these can be done at the same time. You know, while you're working, you, you, learn, um, you learn on the job and you're revising for the exam and you have colleagues around you to support that and to speak English to as well to practice with the proficiency um, exam. And those two are the key elements for obtaining the visa screen certificate. Um, and this is really, this forms the foundation or the base of being able to come here in the USA. And then of course the institutions have their own um, minimum and different criteria depending on the laboratory or the department within the lab, the bench. Yeah. Thank you, Elissa. So that gives a really great roadmap of the steps from a licensing, credentialing, perspective of the exams that need to be taken by a medtech in order to come and live in the United States. Ali, can you share your journey of going through that process, what it was like for you? The ASCPI um, or the, the English exam, the visa screen? Yeah, um, well, uh, in con unlike in any other applicants, for my application, um, I had to break it down uh, into several years for financial reasons, because uh, I think um, any other medical technologist would agree with me that these requirements are actually expensive. So um, I first started my ASCP examination around 2014. And after that, I really did not have any plan of using my ASCP examination to work in the United States. I simply took that examination for, you know, credential purposes and just to have the experience of, you know, taking the examination because at that time I was a fresh graduate. Now, after two years or so, I took my IELTS examination and that was around 2016. Then after that, still I wasn't 100% um, sure to use my English examination to apply here in the United States. When finally here came uh, 2018, where I decided to take up the visa screen application and pursue a career in the, here in the United States. So uh, 2018 was the time where I really decided myself to apply here in the United States. So I compiled all the requirements as uh, what Ellie mentioned and uh, applied for a visa screen certification. And once I received my visa screen certification, we took, uh, which took around three months or so at that time, um, I started applying to different facilities up until uh, 2019, where um, an employer actually took notice of my application. And they petitioned me uh, until uh, I, arrived, I arrived here in the United States come 2022. So it was really a uh, long journey for me. A long journey, my goodness. So yeah. there Alyssa was saying how it is possible to do it quite quickly, but it, you know, it just depends on your circumstances. And as you mentioned, Ali, it's expensive. It really is expensive to go through that process. Um, one thing just to mention is that as a kinetics med tech, if you are placed through kinetics, if you have passed the ASCPI and you get a job through a kinetics employer, like a Methodist Labana, for example, um, kinetics pay for the course for you to do your English exam. This is part of the kinetics care package. It's our way of paying it forward for healthcare workers. Um, and we've seen enormous benefits to healthcare workers of getting that 
that course paid for. Uh, because as Ali, as you know, passing the English exam can be very sometimes more stressful than the ASCPI. You're nodding your head, right? <laughs> okay. Um, so it's a long journey to get to that point. Point, Paul. When you um, evaluate a med tech from overseas, what are you looking for from an education and experience perspective? Um, well, you know, that's a difficult question. Um, education and experience, uh, obviously, uh, the techs are well equipped in that area. They've gotten their certification from the ASCP. Um, I like to see excitement. Um, I, from a technical perspective, like I said, it's, it's kind of covered, but from a personal perspective, that's, that's really different. Um, these days, we're looking more for people who can... Um, who can work with others? Uh, we want someone who fits in with the team, uh, is a is a is a team player and uh, very personable. Um, because you know you live with these people for at least eight hours a day, sometimes ten, sometimes twelve, depending on that shift. And um, you know it it really is difficult if there's someone in the bunch that uh, uh, that makes the toxic environment. Um, so we we really focus on the teamwork aspect, um, more so, in my opinion, more so than the technical aspect, because that really has been proven already with their certification. Okay, so that's interesting to hear that perspective, Paul. So it <clears throat> sounds like those, um, the, the behavioral piece is the part that is really important for you when you interview, looking at that, you know, is this person a team player? Um, can they use the initiative? The, just some of those behaviors. Um, that would make them a good fit for the team. Don, when a, a, a med tech interviews, um, I think, you know, and, and I know we've spoken about this on previous shows as well, um, many facilities use the behavioral-based interviews to be able to evaluate, as Paula said, looking at some of those behaviors of what they want to uh, have in the lab. Can you talk a little bit about the STAR method, the behavioral based technique that will enable healthcare workers to be able to evaluate if, nurse, if nurses, if med techs meet the right criteria? Uh, absolutely. You know, I think I'd like to start off by echoing what uh, Paul just said. It's not just what you do that matters most, it's who you do it with, right? And so I think about um, jobs that you've had, you can look up your schedule. And you can see, OK, this is when I'm going to work. But what you really want to know is who you're going to be with that shift, right? Because that determines how good the shift is going to go when everybody's pulling their weight and they communicate well together and they help each other out. And all those things are so important. So that's why it's important that uh, organizations um, have a feeling for how you're going to work with other people. The teamwork that Paul mentioned is so important. And, and so we do behavioral based interviewing because we know your technical skills are good. We just want to know how you behave in different situations. And the best way to predict how you're going to behave is to know how have you behaved in the past. And so what you want to do is you want to be a superstar when it comes to telling your story. So we, I'm going to use the star model. And what I want to say is you're all stars. You're all very amazing people. You've got incredible talents. Uh, the fact that you're going to come here and be part of a journey to the United States takes so much courage and and I just admire every one of you. You're all stars. Uh, what I want you to be is a superstar when it comes to interviewing. And I'm going to share with you a framework. Sometimes a framework is just a model. It's just a way of thinking. It's a way of framing your answer. And, and I want you to think about how you can use this framework to be really good at behavioral-based interviewing. So you can go ahead and show that graphic one more time. The first thing you want to do, somebody's going to ask you a question. They're going to say, hey, tell me about a time when you had a conflict with a coworker. Uh, they're going to say, tell me about a time when you had to advocate, you had to sort of uh, maybe take on a project that uh, you've never been before. You had to be a lead on something. Uh, tell us about a time when you were frustrated. Uh, how did you manage through that frustration? You know, what conversation did you have with people around you, with your leader? Uh, tell me about a time. And, and they'll just keep what they're asking you to do is tell a story. And the story is going to help them get a sense of how you would handle these different situations. And so when you, when you frame your answer, I want you to think of this STAR model. STAR is S-T-A-R. Um, the A disappeared somewhere in here, but the, the S-T is the situation or task. So 
start your story off and say, well, there's this one time when I had this situation and, and you give, get some background on what the situation was like. Give an example. Um, maybe it's a task you were given by a leader or somebody. I, there's this one time where I was given this task to straighten up or organize a, a piece of the lab or maybe to get some new equipment or do some research on a new piece of equipment. And then, then tell your story about what you did, your action, your A, right? So the A is, well, what I did is I realized I wasn't going to be able to solve this by myself. So, you know, I did some research. I, I called some experts. Uh, I, I visited some other uh, hospitals to see what they did. I, I, I asked my coworkers uh, some questions, uh, you know, talked to my leader. You know, there's a lot of things. We don't do anything by ourselves, but we get other people involved. And when you tell your story that way, you know, the people listening will see you as somebody who's good at engaging other people. You're good at proacting, pro, been proactive. You're good at planning. And so they're listening to your story and they're already making a lot of assumptions about you because they're seeing kind of how you work and how you do things. And then you always want to make sure you do the last part, which is the R. You, you want to make sure you're really good at explaining. And the result was we had a successful implementation of this project. We we got the equipment in and we saw our results at the lab go from increased 20% or the accuracy increased 20%. So be very metric driven, be very clear about specifically how did the improve, what improvement did you see because uh, the action, maybe the relationship with my coworker was better. Uh, we realized we were having not a conflict with each other. We were just having a conflict with a resource that we're trying to use. And so and we scheduled really that resource a certain way. Yeah. And then we never had that conflict again. And we got even more productive in how we use the resource. So, so again, yeah. use your star story. Yeah, Don, I love that. I really love um, the star method. I think it gives um, people who are interviewing, you can be a great med tech, but might not know how to interview. So I think that's really a great tool to be able to learn how to interview. Interviewing is a skill. Um, and we're going to put that graphic into the chat for people to have a look at, um, because I think that it's really important to be able to present yourself in the best way possible. Once you've got a job, we're going to then move on to the next step, which is looking at the immigration piece. Because when the med tech comes to the United States, it's a different process to how it might work for a nurse. I know we do many shows about immigration for nurses, but a med tech has a very different process. So we're going to be bringing in Mike Hammond, who is an immigration lawyer, a friend to the show. We've worked together for many, many years. Um, and Mike is gonna be joining us and uh, gonna be speaking about the immigration pathways. Um, Mike, are you, join are you here? I think we were just gonna bring Mike in real quick and there i see mike hi mike welcome hey, hey tanya how are you good nice to have you on the show mike is a, a, a familiar face on onwards and upwards so we love to have you on the show mike and thank you for joining us do you want to give a here. brief introduction I, I know most people know who you are but go ahead and introduce yourself uh i'm an immigration attorney based in cincinnati ohio with offices throughout the country uh, I specialize in healthcare and IT uh, cases, and uh, our office does about four or five thousand healthcare workers a year. So. so, so Mike and I have known each other for how long, Mike? Um, a very short period of time that can be measured <laughs> in decades. Many, many, many years brought through many healthcare workers together. Um, and Mike is truly an expert in immigration. So we're very um, honored and privileged to have him here to be able to share the immigration pathways for a med tech. So Mike, do you want to share with everybody how, you know, what, what is the processes or the different ro routes that a med tech can come into the United States? Uh, sure. So the... Um... When I say the phrase most common, it's not necessarily the only one, but probably the most common people think of with med techs, which is very different from nurses, is med techs are eligible for H-1 visas. The advantage of an H-1 visa over a um, uh, green card route is that it's simply faster. Um, H-1 visas can kind of be broken down into two kinds of categories, depending upon the type of hospital facility that you're going to work at. There are those that are called cap exempt. Uh, those are hospitals that are nonprofits affiliated with a university. And those uh, H1s do not have to go through the lottery. 
uh, which means that if you match with one of those hospitals and they want to hire you, that in six weeks you could be here in the U.S. working, uh, assuming you met all the qualifications that were already previously uh, outlined uh, um, uh, or earlier. Uh, if the, the standards are uh, you need the visa screen, which has already been talked about, uh, you need the state license or at least be immediately eligible for the state license uh, for the states that have a license, for the states that don't, simply the ASCP is, is, is uh, sufficient enough. Uh, the hospital does a filing with the Department of Labor that occurs fairly quickly. The hospital then does a filing with the Immigration Service, uh, which goes fairly quickly as well. Uh, and then um, you go to an interview at the consulate. And because you're an H1 holder and a healthcare worker, uh, those interviews can occur fairly quickly. Right now, we're seeing interviews in the Philippines in about three weeks, sometimes even a little less than that. Uh, and in other parts of the world, we're seeing interviews within a week, 10 days. We're not seeing any H1 interviews anywhere in the world that are taking more than 30 days to get. So beginning to end, from the time that match is made, six weeks is not an unrealistic uh, uh, kind of time frame to look at for a med tech at a cap exempt facility. A second type of H1 is if you're matched with a facility that's not cap exempt. So they're not nonprofit, they're not affiliated with the university, they're a for profit facility, they don't have affiliations. Those uh, H1 cases have to go through what's called the lottery. The lottery occurs once a year. It occurs in April, but you actually file cases during the window in February and March. The dates vary a little bit, so you kind of want to line those cases up in January. So this is kind of a perfect timing uh, to happen. Last year, we had almost 500,000 registrations for the lottery or submissions for the lottery. Of those almost 500,000, they chose 125,000 due to the fact there's only 85,000 H1s, but they use some algorithms because there's obviously a lot of duplicate filings. People are filing for more than one uh, facility. Uh, those cases are then chosen on April 1st or the day before, and then there's a 90-day window in which the facility would file for you. And if you're approved, then you would go to the interview stage uh, and the interviews would occur. And then you can come in and start working on October 1st. The reason why October 1st is magic is because that's the government's new fiscal year and the H-1 allotment is used on a fiscal year basis. So depending upon your timing of being matched, the lottery can occur, you could be working within, let's call it nine months. If you're identified in January, you get chosen in the lottery, you would be able to work uh, in uh, October. Uh, and obviously the time of the mat. And as far as risks or uh, how often do those get denied and is it hard to get them approved and all those kinds of questions, the answer is there are really no risks. You know, the facility is hiring you as a med tech, they're gonna pay you the prevailing wage that's required by the government and you meet the qualifications, licensure standards ahead of time, there's no risk. We don't go, well, this might get approved or it might not. It'll get approved. Uh, and they're, they're generally in this space, not a lot of issues that are raised. Um, so that kind of is a quick overview of the H-1B. Um, probably the next most common route international uh, med techs would use is what we would call like an EB-3 direct. Um, and generally speaking, so that is a green card. There are a couple advantages to you as an individual uh, in getting a green card through the EB-3 program directly in that one is if you have a spouse who wants to work, then your spouse comes in as a green card holder as well. So both of you get green cards uh, at the beginning. Whereas if you come in with an H-1, your spouse cannot initially work. Your spouse could work later, but they can't work initially. As far as the timing on the green card, though, it's not like the nurse cases. Uh, uh, med techs have to go through what's called a labor market test uh, that requires a recruitment campaign uh, with the Department of Labor. And depending on the facility you're matched up with, um, if they already have a prevailing wage in place, that process can take seven to nine months. If they don't have a, a prevailing wage in place, that process could take 18 months just for the labor stage. Uh, and then you go through the immigration part with the I-140, and then you go through something else with the what's called the National Visa Center, and then you ultimately go for an interview. 
So you would be looking at a processing time of, I would say, best case scenario today with hospital who has a prevailing wage, 18 months. Hospital doesn't have a prevailing wage. We're probably looking at two plus years. Now, some okay. people would go, well, why would you ever choose an EB3 route if it's going to take that long with the H1? And the reason is because not every hospital is cap exempt and um, you know, a nonprofit affiliated. And so a lot of hospitals that are not cap exempt will choose the EB3 green card route over the H1B lottery, or maybe they do both at the same time, simply because the H1B lottery, your odds aren't very good at getting picked. So instead of trying every year and going, oh, I didn't get picked again this year, I'll try again next year. At some point, the hospital says, well, I just want to have a green card program. I'm going to put you in place for that. And even though it's slow, it's steady. And we will get you there. And we're going to get you to this end point that we want. If we happen to get an H1 in the meantime picked in the lottery, well, great, good, we'll bring you in. But if not, we at least have this steady plan. So don't. I, I think it's a, it's a bad decision as a candidate to look at it and go, oh, that's going to take too long. Uh, so I don't want to do that route. I want to wait for uh, an H1B. I think that's probably a, a, a poor decision. So those are the two most so common ways to bring people in. Thank you, Mike. That's a very clear, very um, important clarification of the different routes that are available for a med tech. Um, and obviously, there are pros and cons of each of those different processes. Ali, how did you come to the United States? What was the immigration process that you went through? Well, I came here with an employment-based uh, free visa or an EB3 visa or a green card uh, visa, as they would call it. Uh, I totally agree with what uh, they mentioned that it's a long process. Uh, for me personally, it took me around three years or so going for. It was really a test of patience at the time because um, for the EB3 visa, we have what we call as a retrogression of the visa bulletin. We're in the, um, the visa bulletin uh, actually goes back to its um, uh, older days and processes uh, visas that are the backlog and unfortunately i was one of those affected then after that i was also affected by the sudden closure of the u.s embassies because of the covid pandemic so there uh, i think the embassy closed eight months or so which caused uh, to an additional uh, backlog so it was really indeed a test of patience because for two years i was supposed to come here around 2020 but because of those circumstances that were unanticipated um, I, it took me an additional two years to process my EB3. So it was really um, a test of patience. And considering that within those, within those two years, there was no definite date as to when will I be coming here to the United States. So it was really a blind shot and was not really expecting anything. I was uh, already to the point of losing, um, you know, my, 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 um, enthusiasm because it, it it was really a long process so yeah but at the end of the day it was worth it i would say because i came here with a green card and uh yeah uh but i guess um just like what was mentioned earlier h1b and eb3 both will have their own pros and cons so it's depend uh it will now depend on your personal perspective on which route will you be taking yeah, so you, you, you're so correct. I mean, a test of patience, that's an understatement because I'm sure there were many times there and I can see you nodding your head that you probably thought this is never going to happen. I'm never going to get to America. Um, Don, from an employer's perspective, so I know that Methodist Lebanon have gone through this process from an employer's perspective. Obviously, it's very frustrating as well because, you know, nobody wants to be waiting for three years for that med tech. I mean, Paul would be, you know, really frustrated and um, if we were to say it's going to take three years for the med tech to arrive can you share with everybody what what the experience has been like from your side and how it fits into what mike has explained about the different routes yeah for so for for med techs what you most want to know is is what what do, what do we do when they get here i just want to make sure i understand the question tanya sorry so, so, Don, I was just going to say, what has it been like for you going through the immigration process from a client's perspective, from a hospital's yeah. perspective? Well, for us, it's, it's been great. I mean, it's been a great partnership, first of all. You know, I think communication is the key. 
um, to us. I think it's the key to you too, uh, to anybody on the call. I mean, what you want to know is where am I at in the process and how's things going? And if there's any issues, you want to know that you have somebody you can go to a partner that can help you answer those questions. So some of those are, are process questions that Tanya and her team can help with from Kinetic. Some of those are immigration questions that Mike and his team can answer. And so what I feel like we have, it's a fantastic partnership and those partners are your partners. And so the good news is we all get the information we need to help us get comfortable with where we are in the process and when we're gonna uh, get to the United States and what's gonna happen when we get there. I think that's also where the partnership matters and, and where uh, we come in as the employer and we want to make sure that you're uh, when you get here that you're taken care of and that those first 30 days you have the financial resources you need until you can get started on your job and that you have help getting um, access to apartments and and getting your social security cards and all the things that happen as, as you become an american just so you can get started working we're going to help you get onboarded and make sure all those things are taken care of so uh, our team uh, becomes your team at that point, and we work together to get you started, get you working. And then Paul's team becomes, you know, when I think about the lab leaders and the laboratory um, team members, they become your family, right? And so it's, it's all those things. Uh, it's important for us to know how you're doing. We check in with you as you get here. We want to know how you're doing. Uh, Tanya's team checks with you to make sure you're doing okay after you get started. Uh, so if there's any issues or any questions, we can work on those things together. And yeah. and make sure that that you did you get started and, and and that you're you're really happy yeah and that's what that's the goal we want everybody to be really happy like ollie who's now over that hump that long torturous wait um that mike had had, had explained of of of, of um, what medtechs need to go through if they're coming on the green card route and um, we're going to talk a little bit about that onboarding process but before we do that Elissa, do you want to maybe share a little bit about the different states um, and the license aspect because i think um i think it was mike who maybe mentioned that that some of the states um require a license and some don't that's right so there are some states that require a license um, or have licensure requirements. Most do not require any additional examination. They require, there's the list, they require additional um, documentation or paperwork at, depending on the state at different times um, in the process. So if I were to take Louisiana on the list here as an example, with Louisiana, there's a two part um, process. So a med tech coming to the USA who has an employer in Louisiana, firstly needs to start the process with the Louisiana State Licensing Board um, and eventually get a letter that's known as a uh, deficiency statement. And that just shows that the person could and is eligible to work in Louisiana as a med tech if only they had the right to work in the state and if only they had a social security number. And that document then goes along with the H-1B filing and everything is fine. And then it's picked up at the other end, a little more paperwork. Okay, so there are some states that require a license. We're gonna put that graphic into the chat so that anybody who's going to those states will know which ones um, require that additional step. Um, the, the one thing that was good news for Methodist Labana is that Methodist Labana are in Tennessee and they don't require the state license. So Paul, can you share with us a little bit about the onboarding process when a med tech arrives in the United States um, what what would be the next steps? How how do you go about helping them adjust to life in the United States? Well, let me uh, just uh, correct something. Um, the state of Tennessee does not require a licensure. However, a Methodist Lebanon or Healthcare does. Okay, um, thank you for clarifying. Yeah, the state of Tennessee uh, does not require it unless you are a supervisor, but it still does provide the licensure for employers who actually prefer that. Um, okay. And then that's just a little extra step for us to make sure we get the highest quality uh, med techs if possible. Um, so uh, onboarding, uh, onboarding a new international tech um, in the past, what we've done is we pair them up with another tech, um, a more senior tech, but uh, similar in age, um, uh, because I think a, a lot of the uh, difficulty and adjustment is uh, social adjustment. Um, one of the issues that I see or have seen in the past 
uh, one of the larger issues is transportation. Uh, you, you would think that that would be a very small thing, but um, many or most international techs um, don't have a driver's license when they get here. Um, so it's very difficult, particularly for hospitals that are more rural than uh, the larger ones, uh, to get around. Um, for example, our university hospital is in the middle of Memphis, and uh, there are apartments within walking distance. Uh, we have a hospital in northern Mississippi that uh, it is <laughs> very far from the nearest department, uh, so that there's really no opportunity um, to get there through public transportation. Uh, you would you would have to Uber or otherwise taxi or 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 have a buddy, and and sometimes that's the key is to have that buddy to help you transition from um, the way that you you. you your daily life was prior to the the transition uh, to your new your new state. I mean, and honestly, um, the transition, the onboarding for um, the technical aspect is pretty straightforward. Uh, we we teach, we go through the different analyzers, we go through the different processes, um, uh, policies and procedures. And we, we make sure there's checklists and we check everybody off to make sure they're competent. Um, and, and that's all fine and good. That's that's standard everywhere. But I think the key is to have those people uh, with the partnerships uh, that can help you through the day to day, just simple questions. And, you know, I don't know how to do this. You know, that's that's very difficult. Um, that's, that's a big change for anyone. But coming from a new job or coming from to a new job from so far away. I mean, I think that's key. Okay, yeah, a lot of a lot to um, to manage when a med tech arrives in the United States. So it's not just the clinical aspect and learning a new job and a new system and new processes, but also um, just living in in a new environment, which can be very stressful. Things like transportation, um, finding permanent housing, putting the kids in school, maybe a spouse finding a job if they're able to work. Ali, what was that like for you, the transition? And what advice would you give to a med tech arriving in the United States? Yeah, um, so um, before I came here to the United States, um, I already had a very good communication with the hospital that I will be working since 2019. So I never lost uh, communication with them. I always update them with uh, where I am in the process. And um, I also seek the help of our laboratory director um, with respect to transportation, um, housing, if they can recommend um, nearby apartments and so on. And they were very helpful. Uh, though we did not yet have any physical contact, still they were very helpful and very understanding. And they were also very accommodating since the day that I arrived. So um, what's good is that when I arrived here in the United States, it seems like we already established that relationship, even though it was my first time meeting them face to face. And um, I would say for those who are planning to come here to the United States is to be in constant communication with the hospital that you, uh, you will be assigned to, uh, be in constant communication with the director. Um, if you can ask their help, then that will be very great. Uh, also, be in constant communication with your future co-workers, for example, uh, ask if they have any Filipino community. Uh, unfortunately for me, I am the only Filipino here in our uh, laboratory. That's why um, uh, I did not ask the help of any other Filipino. So I was the first one. But um, And because of that experience, I am now helping future Filipino applicants um, in their migration here in the United States, especially here in um, our laboratory, I tell them what uh, an overview of what is to expect in our community. And so, yeah, it's all about helping uh, others who, you know, uh, because I, I've been there and I know the feeling. Yeah, and I love that you're paying it forward now, Ali, and helping so many people. Um, and I want to um, give Ali's group a plug. Ali has a book, a, a group, I think it's on Facebook, right, Ali? With how yeah. many thousands of, yeah. of med takes? 
uh, I uh, because of that, um, because of you know, I want to help uh, the Filipino community. I uh, put up a small group with seven thousand members who are currently watching uh, our live show now. The name on Facebook is uh, Aspiring MedTech or MLS to the United States. So if ever they um, uh, want advice, if they seek for help, uh, if, they are, uh, if they don't know what to expect or if they don't know the process, uh, someone will help you in that community of medical technology. So that group has been established to you know, help and empower medical technologists who are planning uh, a career here in the United States. So uh, and that is a collaborative effort. I do not uh, take all the credit. It's a collaborative effort for, you know, uh, med techs who have been staying here, who have been living here, sharing their own pieces of advices to the newbies coming to the United States. So, uh, yeah, it's a collaborative effort. Oh, and I, and we I love your big heart, Ali, and the fact that you have put that group together. Um, I think that speaks volumes about you as a person and being able to pay it forward and, and share and help uh, fellow medics as they come to the United States, because it is a challenge in the beginning. Um, at Kinetics, we have a circle of support. Um, these are a lot of different ways that we support the, the medtechs and any other healthcare workers when they come in. And on the circle of support, you can see it on our website. Um, we are we just showing a graphic of it here. These are all the different resources that we provide to the nurses when they arrive. As Paul was saying, sometimes it's, it's um, you know, having uh, getting a car and we have a lot of community resources of where you can get a car loan, how to buy a car or, or lease a car. We have the, the Kinetics Angel Network. These are this is a mentorship program. We put you with buddies. We have a Kinetics Clubhouse where we um, where we will help the healthcare workers of how to um, how to build your credit it, how to pay your taxes in the United States. So lots of different ways that we help support um, healthcare workers. Lisa, I'm just looking at the clock. We have six minutes till the end of the show. And um, do you want to very briefly just share with, with um, the med techs around the world, it, just what your best advice is for med techs that are embarking on this journey? Yeah, I think my best advice is to be able to is for them to act intentionally and to really think about what their life might look like here in the USA um, professionally, um, if they reflect on what they've enjoyed to date about their careers and working in the lab, what they've learned, some of the interactions they've had, um, sort of thinking about some of the things that Don mentioned earlier. And really then, you know, if every day is a school day where we can learn from that and then think about things going forward and then translate that into perhaps the type of environment they would really like to work in. Perhaps there's somebody who would like to be part of a really big system and a very busy hospital setting, or perhaps they would like a smaller setting. Um, so, they, so they focus on themselves and what um, they would enjoy or think they would enjoy most. Um, so act intentionally. And this can take that's, some time to do. Um, yeah, that's and then Sorry, Alyssa. It's okay. Did and you... then... Uh, Go ahead. The, <laughs> the other aspect of that is ensuring um, that you are as organised as possible with any files or documents and always give them an appropriate name so you know what is in, in that document. Um, oh, that's a great I, tip. Yeah, that, yeah so that's then, a great tip, Alyssa, because mm -hmm. I think being organized is really important, especially if you come on an H1, because, Mike, if you're going to be doing an EB3 green card, um, uh, adjustment of status green card after being in the United States for a while, um, it, it, being organized and having your documents is really important to be able to file that next step, right? Can you tell us just very, very briefly about that? Uh, sure. So if you come to the U.S. on an H-1 and you're wanting a green card and your employer wants to sponsor you for a green card, you would go through the EB-3 green card process. But instead of having the final stage at the consulate and an interview, you would have it done here in the U.S. under something called adjustment of status. And that is a stage that focuses specifically on you as an individual and your entire history. You uh, submit medical exams. They go through security clearances and a whole series of questions they ask you about your background and your family's background. Uh, and there's a lot of information, a lot of documents that they look for. And so 
I'd certainly echo that being organized and having all your documents ready can make that process a lot smoother. Um, and uh, the, the green card process through the adjustment that Tanya mentioned is part of while you're already working on the H-1. So the timing is not quite as critical for people because you're already here, you're already living, you're already working. Your spouse is usually already working by that time too, but it is a process that you have to have to go through to ultimately get the green card. Okay, so more to come on that. And if you're interested in knowing more about the adjustment of status green card process, please go to the Kinetics USA website. And we have a full show that we did on that process, talking about the different steps and how that works if you are here on an H1 and are looking to go through the adjustment of status green card. Um, Paul and Don, I think we have like a minute or two. Um, if you want to maybe share your advice or, or, or pointers or tips for med techs that are watching around the United States. Let's start with you, Paul. Um, get along with people, number one. Um, uh, number two, show up. <laughs> uh, Good I, advice. <laughs> Short um, and simple. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, really, uh, if you can get along with people and you can show up for work, uh, I, those are the two main ingredients to being a successful med tech because we can teach you anything. Uh, you're smart enough. You, you're certified. You've obviously shown that that you can you can learn. Um, what we need are people to to be part of the family and actually be present as a part of the family. Thank you, Paul. And Don, final words in the last minute. <laughs> You on mute, Don. You on mute. Thank you. I love that. If you show up, showing up is half a success. And my mom always said, if you just get started, you're halfway there. So get started on this process uh, and you will be happy that you did it. And be willing to open yourself up, ask for help and accept help. That's the key thing. I and mean, we say teamwork is important, but who gets in the way of teamwork? If I don't raise my hand, I let people know I need help. And if I don't accept help, then I'm the one getting in the way of teamwork. So be a great team player and, and let us help you because uh, I've never accomplished anything in my entire life significant by myself. So we all need each other and, and we need you. So thank you for choosing uh, and considering coming to the United States. Well, Don, that is a perfect way to end the show. Get started and let's work together to get you to the United States. So thank you, everybody, for joining us around the world. Thank you to Elisa, to Mike, Paul, Ali, and Don for uh, sharing your experience, your advice, your pointers, your tips about this process. It's not an easy journey. It can take a long time. We don't want it to take as long as poor Ali's journey did um, for anybody who's watching today, but we are here to help uh, and to share information to help you to live your American dream. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Apologies for the technical hitches. Um, and we will see you next week, onwards and upwards. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.